Jay, we are beyond excited to have you on the show, man. Um, I'm excited to be here with you guys. Thank you. So we got a lot of people who have a lot of questions for you, man. So let's uh, first, let's just give a little background here. So you played Vega in the 90s Street Fighter 2 movie um, with uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme from back in the day. That's correct. Um, so first off, you look great. <laughs> um, second, talk to us about how that role, how you got that role. Uh, how did that come about? Um, well, in the early 1990s, Street Fighter had become this phenomenal game. So, um, oh, here, let, let, let me get you cleaned up. Here we go. Let's let's do yeah. that. There we go. And um, so, my agent at the time was actually someone who's become really famous now, Steve Levinson who's now Mark Wahlberg's uh, producing partner. And he did uh, Entourage. He went on to do Mad Men and lots of great projects and movies. He's a famous producer now. By the time he was my agent at United Talent. And uh, I remember we were flirting with which one of these characters I could play. And he wanted me to play Ryu. He thought I look Asianic enough to play Ryu and had the martial arts skills. But when I read the script and I saw the entrance to Vega, where he's coming into this cage, and this is pre-MMA. There was no cage fighting yet and whatever. But I visualized him coming in with his vaguettes, carrying, one carrying his mask, one carries his um, claw. So it was, as soon as I read it, I said, I know this guy. And at the time when the audition started, the three names that were up for this role was Antonio Banderas, Antonio Sabata Jr., and Isai Morales. And Isai was the most famous of the group at the time. And I thought, my God, I'm up against three legends. <laughs> There's no chance. But um, as destiny has it, I was visually the most suited to Vega. I was in the better shape of all the four of us. We were down to those four. And um, it was a process of several different auditions. And I finally met with Steven D'Souza, our director. And he, he thought I was the right choice for this character. because. The description was brutally muscled with matling idol looks. So everybody in LA said, that's me. <laughs> Let's go, man. I'll tell you what, I think that's how everybody is. Everybody in the world has ever been uh, aspired to be described. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> brutally muscled with matling idol looks. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Love it. So so you, you get cast. Yeah. Um, and it's it's been interesting to kind of see what's happened over over the the last few few decades since this movie's released we've heard all sorts of really interesting um stories as uh, yes. i put i put out on twitter uh people could ask questions and carl uh asked uh was asking says since it's released the movie has had so many different issues about the production brought to light uh, uh -huh. can you sh can you share any production issues that you witnessed firsthand um so yeah, I, I guess let's let's talk about that. Did did you have any issues with the production? Because that that's the thing that we've heard continuously about the movie since uh, over the uh, last thirty years. It wasn't. It was an unusual shoot. I mean, we we started it in Bangkok, Thailand, and then we went to Australia for like three and a half months. Then we went to Vancouver. So we shot in three different countries, and it took uh, about five and a half six months. And um, one of the issues was. Our creative director, who's also really famous, right? Like Steven D'Souza, for those who don't know, in the 1980s was a legendary screenwriter. He wrote Die Hard, Running Man, Commando, like every action movie you think this guy was behind it. So when he was approached to write Street Fighter, he had said, I would do it if I can direct it. So he had, he had chosen to do this as his first film. And um, I think one of the things most people realized was between having... Um, Sorry, these guys are blowing leaves. Here. No worries, no worries. I can close it if you want. No, but, no, do uh, your thing. So it was, the challenge was him. Sometimes he would come up with that idea and he would write it. And he didn't realize like the production needs to create it now. So there was some of those stuff that he would come up with these incredible ideas. And then we had to like wait for the production to actually create it. Um, as far as casting goes, I heard there were some issues too, because there were so many people who wanted to play these parts, but in the end, they made it a non-union movie and took us all the way to Thailand and Australia to shoot it. So, but um, 
I mean, there was, in any movie I've ever been, there's some dichotomy of the cast and crew that always, there's challenges. But this movie, really, the challenge was try to, you know, like hardly any of the actors were martial artists. So Benny the Jet, who was our, our fight choreographer and uh, trainer, had his hand full. He had us for several months before the film, and he had to like create these guys who could be experts in these different styles of fighting. So that was another challenge to also keep the kids happy. So, and also like the biggest challenge was they were trying to make a movie that was PG-13, and it was called Street Fighter. Right. It was the first like a big production that was coming out, and the the labels were really on it, the, the, the sensors. They were like, not even a cracking bone or a slight blood, he was not going to get his rating. So that was his biggest challenge, to try to make a movie that was the right PG, called Street Fighter, and still deliver. See, that's, that was the difference between Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter, because I was up for that movie too. And Mortal Kombat went full on with gore and blood, and so they ended up making more money than Street Fighter. Well, not now. After 30 years, Street Fighter now is a cult, pop cult classic. And uh, it's ironic that next year is the 30th anniversary. And we're going to do a documentary on it, actually. And it's, I can't believe 30 years later, it's now become even a bigger movie than it ever was. Wait, so you were, you were up for the Mortal Kombat movie as well? Yes, I was up for one of the roles. For, I think it was the main, the, the, the villain, the big uh, spirit. I forgot his name. Now. Shang Tsung? Yeah, the, the main guy with the, who went to the Japanese uh, right. actor. But yeah, I was actually at the same time because of the casting both. And I was literally, I had an offer for both. But I thought Street Fighter made most sense. They had the biggest stars. It was a bigger game. It was the American game versus the Japanese. Sorry, that was the Japanese game. Mortal yeah. Kombat was the American game. So anyway, it was, um, it was a very interesting era for Hollywood, in fact. Because it okay. was like... Yeah. Anyway, yeah. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Continue. I did. I certainly didn't mean to cut you no, off. No, no. I'm just saying that it's like, and one of the things that happened was since I was so ripped, they couldn't double me. And one of the other challenges was I ended up doing all my own stunts. And ever <laughs> since then, that got stuck with me, and I've become like a, a Jackie Chan because I've, in all my projects throughout my career, I've done my own stunts because of that movie. <laughs> because you look like good. this, huh? Yeah, I, was... I did that movie, and every director goes, oh, well, you can do your own stunts. You can jump <laughs> off the horse. You can go I... through that window. You can do it. You know? so I, I was going to ask there. you, when you go to a foreign country like that, I, where I it's non-union, are, 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 are they able to let you what? do more stunts and stuff? Well, you know, it's so funny. I've got away with murder because I'm not really a stunt associated. You know, I could have got my stunt card, but I never wanted to be a stuntman. I wanted to be an actor who does his own stunts. And it's very sensitive in Hollywood, like stuntees, as we call them, don't like actors who do their own stunts because we take away their jobs, you know? You supposed to say your lines and you step out and they come and do the fancy stuff. But for me, the physicality of a role is what always I've been turned on by and I want to do as much as I can. So that's how I started to, to like be, do my own things. And it was, it's, it's a wonderful fun. I mean, that's the fun. In CSR Miami, I got to go through a 24 story building through a glass plate, falling backwards 220 feet. So I've done a lot of crazy stuff through my life. But on Street Fighter, believe you me, the tank scene where the tank crushes that stage, that was a pretty serious, like when the, they only had two stages. So if the stage collapsed once, they could only do it once again. And the first time, the it was a real tank with a real Thai driver. Came through that wall. Nobody had told the extras they're supposed to scram. So he almost crushed the first group of, that was the first stage. So now I'm thinking I'm in the middle of this stage and I'm gonna jump out and they had, they had to like wire the floor with it. It was a collapsible floor. And in the last minute they take these wire, these uh, tapes off. So you have to remember your path out of the place. So I remember that Charlie Paterni, our second unit director, I said to him right before the tape, any advice for me? He goes, yeah, what you don't get killed? <laughs> that literally well, was the advice for me as the tank came through the wall he goes just get the hell out of there son and if you remember I did that famous Vega dive out of there which really didn't end up in the movie the way it was because I flew like 15 feet out of that cage just purely out of fear and I was petrified wow that, that's crazy yeah the the, uh, the scene with it, with it coming through 
can't can't show footage of it obviously on YouTube, but we can show some some stills of it. Yes. Uh, of, of that of that thing coming through. Yeah, that I mean, tank, the real tank with John Claude in it. But, uh, <laughs> that, it's crazy to think about. So, uh, man, real quick, hold on. You did something which we, we did not we did not do enough justice. We need to see those guns one more time. Let's look. I get you. You were like, I still got it. I mean, God dang. <laughs> Thirty years later, the Vega guns still exist. God, I was gonna say go. you could have been a stunt double for uh, Jean Claude, but yeah, you know well, it's what I mean? funny. It's funny, but he no, he had great arms. He was. I definitely motivated him to be in shape. Okay, okay. There's so much we got to get into. So much. So okay. And by the way, uh, Bill has joined us as well. Bill, how are you, buddy? Welcome on in. Oh yeah, sorry. No, no worries. So, so <laughs> yeah. Uh, Bill yeah, Bill does uh, a, a classic game channel as well. They, they do retro game huntings, and and Bill grew up watching St Street Fighter. I don't want I don't mean to speak for you. So, yeah. uh, Bill, if you have any questions for Jay, by all means. Um, but you, you mentioned something, Jay. The idea that um, that it, there was a, a, a stud cast here. You had Jean Claude Van Damme, Raul Julia, Kylie Minogue, right? You you and there's a lot of like pretty big name people in this yeah. movie. Andrew Bernowski. Right. I, I mean, it, it goes on and on. Right. And um, for Kylie Minogue, it was an amazing cast. So how <laughs> number one, <laughs> and this is from this is from Mark the Cyborg over on Twitter. He says, how did anyone get any work done uh, over over uh, on set with both uh, Ming-Na Wen and Kylie Minogue walking around? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. We had and uh and I, I think also that a very something that's that's come out over the years is that this was a time uh, in Jean Claude Van Damme's life and career where he talked about he was just doing insane amount of drugs, right? And he's he said publicly that in this movie he was like coked out of his mind, right? Did you see any of that stuff on set? And what were your interactions with JCVD? And no, I, I, mean, I would just love to hear all that. Before I did this movie, I knew Jean-Claude. I had done a little short with him where I was the villain in his little short he had shot. So I, I was aware of him. And uh, so when I was cast, there was nothing to do. He didn't know I was in the movie. So definitely it's true what you heard. I mean, this was, first of all, it was the highest uh, payday for him. They paid him like, I think, seven mil for six and a half weeks. And it's one of his highest grossing movies to date. I think Time Cop might be the highest, but... This is definitely in the top two for him. And um, yeah, he was he was basically out of control. And um, it, it, we, we had a lot of colorful moments. I mean, he sometimes he would direct, sometimes he would not, you know, he was almost flirtatious. He got into trouble by like, you know, like it, it was just literally like the word you use is out of control was the thing. Like they couldn't control him. So they just let him be Jean-Claude, you know, and it was... Um, it was quite fascinating that he managed to pull it off because it was literally like he would show up on the set. You didn't know if it was still from last night or is he still okay? But but he managed to like perform his what he had to do. So that's he was a professional in that sense. But I got along with him. He was, he was a fun guy. Jean Claude still is to this day when I see him, he's a fun guy. He was uh, like as I said, that was like the height of his career, and he was totally like he, as he admitted afterwards, he was. Basically, got a totally out of control when he was doing it. Do you have any any stories that really pop just just off the top of your head uh, about about anything that was crazy or um, I don't know that that you can share? Um, let me think. Um, uh, well, I think um, let me think on the set. What happened? Um, well, the funny, one of the funniest things was when I was shooting that, that scene you just showed. Um, we first shot it in Australia. So we had Australian extras screaming my name as I arrived, going, Vag, Vag, and in Australian accent, Vag, Vag, Vag. Then we went to, um, we went, sorry, we went from Bangkok. We were in Thailand first. We shot it there. So all these guys in Asian accent going, Vag, Vag. Then we went to Australia trying to recreate the same scene. So they were doing it with an Australian accent. And that was hilarious because they cast people who looked like the guys in Thailand, but now they had an Australian accent. So they went from 
Vega, Vega to Vega, Vega. So that was one of the funniest things I remember. But um, right off hand, I mean, I, I remember one day, one of the producers, I believe it was Edward Press, Pressman, he was, um, they, they were caught smoking in the back of a limo. <laughs> and in Thailand back then, it was illegal. Now it's free. One is three, but back then was illegal. I think they got into a little bit of trouble right in the first week because they, they had to light up a joint. And uh, so that was wow. about it, really. Really, nothing, nothing too uh, juicy on that. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing. It seems like it was a, a totally different time, uh, just just from when it comes to it movies. It is just and controlling all these personalities. When we had a pop star like Kylie Minogue. We had a movie star out of control like Jean-Claude. And then we had like Andrew, Andrew Bernaski. We had, you know, we had Peter Tuyasosopo from Unnecessary Roughness. It was just the characters look like the real life Street Fighters. They were oh, and if I recall, if I recall back then, Kylie what? was one of the highest paid uh, pop stars back then. And oh, Jean-Claude was one of the highest paid movie stars back then. He was. He was the number one yeah. action star at the time. Yeah. He really was. Man, Apolog crazy. Apologies if this has already been asked, because obviously I was I was late and just popped in. But had you actually been a big fan of the game before? I uh, I had I was, but I hadn't really played it. I'm actually a voiceover actor, so I make a lot of these games. I've been in mm -hmm. like uh, Metal Solid Metal Gear. I've been in yeah. Gun. I've been in a lot of these. I do the voices, but no, I haven't played it. But during the filming, we had a Street Fighter machine on the on the set, so we we got to learn all the techniques. And I'll tell you a funny story. Like after the movie was done, I was in Westwood here in LA. We went to an arcade. I was married at the time. And I saw a crowd around a Street Fighter and had a Street Fighter movie version of the game. Oh, yeah. We, I crept to the front at a cap on. I noticed the kid was playing Vega and it was really me. And he was getting my ass kicked. <laughs> so I looked at my wife. She goes, don't even think about it. So I crawled right next to him. And I said, kid hold the thing down, the joystick, and I was showing him the special moves. So the kid is doing it now, his points started to go up, and it was just like the movies. He looked over his shoulder, and I was trying to hide my face. So he looks at my face again, and he looks in the screen, he looks at my face, and then this hand came from behind, it was my wife, and she dragged me through there. But it literally was the movie, because he was playing the game, and I was going, wait a sec, you know? <laughs> like, well, that had to have been a surreal everything. experience. Oh, that's my funny story in Westwood. <laughs> okay, well, well, let's talk about that though, because the the game comes out. Street Fighter, the movie, the game was that a was that a separate shoot, or did they just uh, did they it do? Was any... separate. We went so... on to a blue screen. In fact, this was the first. That's why I put this up here. This was the original poster for Street Fighter. I was right in the center. But Jean Claude didn't like this one, so they changed it. <laughs> <laughs> he, he didn't have the, uh, it wasn't did, all focused on him, huh? All became little guys down here, and it became his head, those two up there. But <laughs> originally, this was the original. Universal had approved this. That's why I have the original poster. And here's the mask for all the fans the actual mask. That's so cool. Inside, it has the contour of my face. I had to sit for a prosthetic on this to, to create the actual mask from the from the movie. There's three of these was made. This was one of the three. Wow. Um, what That's was your awesome. question? You just asked me something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was just asking about the, the, the video game. Uh, obviously, yes, they, the, the they, they did a, a blue screen, I believe. And we all, all of us were captured on this blue screen. And we all did the special moves and added few moves as well. But, but it was really hard to go into an arcade and watch someone play you and you're watching yourself getting your ass kicked. So <laughs> it took a while to get used to it. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. That is absolutely fascinating. I love to have one of those at home. I've been looking for one of those. I want to get the arcade machine. So well, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what, we can uh, we can set you up. We, I, I always know people. I always know people I, who, I <laughs> for sure. Um, well, I'll tell you what, man, this is, I mean, awesome stuff. Do you, uh, obviously you've kept yourself in phenomenal shape over the years and yes. uh, you know we're talking about you from uh well let's, let's talk about you, you staying in shape first because obviously your your career has been more than the street fighter movie but that's yes. obviously how our audience would know you um let's talk about your workout because that's one of the things that people have at that that's i got that many many times on twitter ask about his workout routine so what are you doing to stay in shape and a whole and to have those massive guns 
Well, I've always, like, I, I can't lie. I've always been really lean, low body fat. So my key in life has always been to just maintain my body weight. I've been the same adult weight since I was, like, in my mid-20s. So I never really fluctuated too much in my body weight. And I maintained my body fat levels, which was always in single digit. That was really the key. And maintenance is much easier than getting there. Once you get there, to maintain it is always a little simple. I tell people, get optimize your body. And then, you know, and I ne never really abused myself. I had fun. I had my share of partying and stuff. But I always knew when to, um, when to stop. And it's a combination of weight training, um, yoga, cardio. It's nothing unique except I tweaked it for me. And I, I tell people, like, you're not one in a million. You're one of a kind. So you need to find what works for you. So each one of us, part of our journey in life is to work out your own manual of how your body works, how your mind works, and getting to know yourself. And that's why I love this profession. Every role I do, every job, kind of like, it's, it's more of a revelation. You go, you dive into a character and you take something from Vega, you take something from all these other roles. And yes, you're right. After Street Fighter, I went on to be in, my, I'm proud of being in four Oscar winning movies throughout my career. And everybody always talks about Vega, but I was in Cold Mountain, the missing adaptation, you know, the Pathfinder. I worked with Steven Spielberg in Into the West, the miniseries. So I've done some really uh, much more uh, critically acclaimed work, but Vega is something you can never shake off. To this day, when I go to airports anywhere in the world, I get recognized sometimes, which is shocking. I mean, it's like, these, it's 30 years ago, but. And I always know the guy is lying because he said, can you sign this for my son? And I look at him and go, it's your son, huh? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you sure is your son now because your son wasn't even born 30 years ago. <laughs> well, so are, are you doing any sort of uh, any sort of like gaming convention appearances or anything like that? I think that, no, you know. No, but I've just started to go to some. It's like I've been invited for years to go to Comic-Con and uh, it's a couple of martial arts fests, like Dragon Fest. I've just started to go to these and uh, meet some of the fans because I've realized it's enough time has passed now and it's become an iconic thing. And you you can't dictate where your roles end up or go, but as destiny has it, Vega is it's become this unforgettable thing I can never shake off now. So I, I'm kind of like, I'm kind of proud of it. It's like being a Bond girl. You're always a Bond girl. <laughs> Yeah, Sydney wants Sydney wants to let you know that the movie's age aged like fine wine. There you go, love that. It it's uh... so you also were in uh, executive decision with Steven Seagal, and you you seem like you know you obviously um, in addition to your voice work, you know you uh, Joe over on Twitter was asking um, what was it like to work on that movie. And then the ultimate question is, who would win in a fight between Steven Seagal and Jean-Claude Van Damme? <laughs> Executive Decision was a really interesting project because they built the actual fuselage of a 747 on the largest soundstage in the world, which was in Warner Brothers right here um, in LA. And, uh, for like, and it was 1996 that we had a heat wave. And I remember it was very challenging because we had to be inside this fuselage for months at a time. It was literally, and I built it 60 feet up in the air. So the, the set was us climbing these ladders, getting into this fuselage above the sound stage and literally staying in there all day, the, most of it. So, but it was again, incredible cast and um, Joe Silver as a producer. And um, our director was a, also a, Again, a first-time director, but he was a very famous editor. He had edited some very famous movies. And um, and uh, what I enjoyed about that especially was, uh, like, Seagal had some issues on that. I remember Steven Seagal a few times came on the set and saw a complete tantrum. Like, he looked at the way they had set up and said, I used to work for the CIA. This is, I was an operative. This is not how you carry a gun. You carry a gun like this. You don't do, I mean, he literally was out of control again. And uh, he had a few issues on there. And it was the only film he's ever got killed on. I don't know if you know that or not. It's the only yes. film that he actually gets killed. So he was there only for a few weeks. He was supposed to get sucked out of the plane. But even in those few weeks, he caused chaos. So he was a, 
a difficult personality. And, then, and if there was a fight between him and Jean-Claude um, in his heydays, probably Steven, because he, his, uh, his, his, his Aikido skills and stuff was real. He, he really had those, those lock-in mechanisms and stuff, you know. But I know that story that when he went up against um, um, the judo guy, what was his name? Um, I think uh, I remember this, what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I know him as well. I've actually worked with him. Um, he just passed away last year, I think. He, um, Jean LaBelle. He went up yes. Jean LaBelle. Jean choked him out. That's, that's a true story. But... Uh, Jean-Claude, I'm not sure. And, and Jean-Claude has also got a reputation. People say he's a dancer, he's not a martial artist. He's a martial artist. He actually won martial art contests, but never a world champion. So there's a difference between him and someone like Dolph Lundgren, who really was the world full contact karate champion. So like Dolph would really kick his ass. But, <laughs> mm. but in real life, you know, he, he had a great form. He was an athlete. He looked good. But I would put Jean-Claude more of a dancer than a full-on martial artist, you know? Nice. So, man, that, that, you, you have crossed paths with a lot, lot of our, like action stars, a lot of people who would be in like expendables, right? It's true. Uh, it's right. true. Is, is there, who was the nicest to work with and who was just the biggest headache to work with? You mentioned Steven Seagal and JC, they, they yeah. had their issues, but is there anybody, the nicest and the, and the you know, biggest headache? The nicest. Carl Urban was one of the nicest guys I've ever worked with. Carl Urban. I worked with him on Pathfinder. One of the nicest guys. He was the lead in the movie too. And But he was just so down to earth. That's so nice. Um, uh, um, Tommy Lee Jones, one of the most difficult. But really? he goes out of his way to be difficult. I loved him. I got along with him. But he could be very abrupt. He could be very like, like he was all about the work. If you come and start a chit chat with him, he might just walk off on you. He was just known to be like brutal when he was like. He, he always comes off as a grumpy old man. Doesn't I, he? I made a mistake once. I, I, we were working on a scene and I, he did something great. And I said, Tommy, I love your instincts. And he just looked at me with his cold eyes. and says, kid, instincts is for dogs that fuck in the streets and birds that fly south. That was literally his answer to me. I was like, uh, uh. A thank you would have been nice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the coolest fucking thing anybody's ever said, right? <laughs> let's let's be real. That's really it cool. It is. And you <laughs> said it right about Ron Howard. We all like look we're like, okay, let's let's get out of this trailer. <laughs> oh my god, that is amazing. I, I can't imagine how hard it is for some of these directors to work with some of these actors with oh. the egos and well, not can. even so much the egos, but just the the, the, they just work on a different level mentally than a lot of people. Like some of these guys I've worked with, they say how many takes they want, not the director. Like the director, is that yep. good for you? They decide to go, no, no, I got one more. They decide how many takes they do. That That's that crazy takes. to me. That's yeah, crazy. Because, I mean, yeah, because I remember you you said that uh, Jean Claude was, um, he was directing some of the scenes you said. And it's like, wow, I wonder how the director felt about that. Well, I mean, <laughs> He actually got involved, like trying to show like Ryu to do some of the moves and stuff, and some of the other actors didn't like, you know, like he was showing how to like do an open palm thing or whatever. But mm -hmm. he was, uh, he was very animated, you know. Jean Claude, you could see he was on something. He was very animated on Street Fighter, you know. It was like uh, I remember I trained with him one day. He said, "Let's train together." We trained, and um, and then he said, "Let's go jump in the ocean." And this is Australia with white sharks. I said. You go jump in those shots. <laughs> like, no thanks, you go. <laughs> well, I tell you what, you seem like a one hell of a nice guy. So I'd much rather work with guys like you than, Thank you. than guys Thank like you. that. Um who else? Meryl Streep, one of the nicest human beings ever. I worked with Meryl Streep, and I you would think someone with her aura would be, you know, diva, but she was again so down to earth, so sweet. Kate Blanchett also. To, I, I found the bigger they are, usually the nicer they are, actually. You know, sometimes you get exceptions, but the biggest names I've seen, they usually are the sweetest down-to-earth people I've seen. And I think it goes with the territory. They know who they are. You know, like Kate was absolutely amazing. Um, who else? Halle Berry. I had a good time with Halle on, on executive decisions. Right now. I've been very fortunate. I've worked with some of the most amazing act, female actors. Like, right. Uh, 
Kerry Russell, um, Halle Berry, um, Kate Blanchett, Meryl Streep. I mean, you know, I've had a really good list of amazing actresses I've worked with throughout my career. Well, let's let's finish this with with talking about uh, a, a legend in in his own rights and the last movie that he did. I'm speaking of Raul Julia. Oh. Uh, uh, how was he on set? What was he like? And and did you have you know he uh, the movie was released after after he passed on. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Just love to hear your thoughts on Raul Julia. Yeah. Well, Raul, first of all, maybe learn he was like six foot four, maybe even taller. And when he came to our set, he had just had a full surgery with that cutting from up here down there, stomach surgery. And he was 164 pounds at six four, wow. and he was so weak. So the challenge was to get him ready for to play bison, this like a warlord, literally. And to, the reason he had taken the job is because his kids loved the movie, you know, and they said, Dad, you got to play this. So he decided to take it. And uh, he was able to put on the bison uniform and he would like literally sleep on the makeup chair while they were getting him ready. When they would say, Mr. Rao, Mr. Julia, we're ready for you. He would get up, he would take a couple of breaths. How he did it, I still don't know. He was able to like mentally turn on a switch and he would go, <laughs> he would become bison. And I would go, did you see that? The guy was like, he was half dead two minutes ago. He was just, I mean, it was something spectacular to watch how he could just switch it on and will the cow out of him. So he would will it, literally become this uber power. And um, wow, that's cool. God. Again, he was another huge loss, huge loss. To in fact, I flew back with him from Australia when we were coming back, and that was the last time I saw him because he went to do a movie in Canada, and I think three weeks later he was gone. With yeah, and, 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 and Street Fighter, he really put a lot of passion and emotion into that character, and you it's can unbelievable. You can see it. And he yeah. ad libbed. There were some funny lines he put in there, like when he took it to Sagat. And he says, did you see that? He goes, I guess you didn't see that either. He covers the other eye because he's about that. He was as, just brilliant. You know? as, an act, as an actor, do you think that it helps for that transformation when you're actually, you know, in that costume and that costume gets on you? It's almost like, I guess, when you're putting on a mask, it's Absolutely. like you feel like a different person. You think that has a lot to do with it? Absolutely. For me, I, I, I need to see the character in the mirror. Then that's why the physicality is so important to me. You got the character's walk. You got the character. That's why, for me, the physical aspect. I approach my characters like that. I, I need to get that physicality because then, you know, then he comes out of there. Like if I'm going to play New Yorker, as soon as I go, yo, forget about it. You know, as soon as I go, <laughs> the physicality comes with it. You know. It's, yeah. So yeah, definitely. He was he was just a master at it. I mean, that guy literally did theater, did Broadway, did movies. He had everything. I think he had an Oscar, a Grammy, and a Tony. He had everything. Man. When uh, I will say that the one thing that is the like the memeable aspect of that movie is is a never ending, right? Obviously, the big line with with Bison and, and saying, you know, for me it was Tuesday. You know that that's like the line that we oh, hear right. in the gaming space all the time. You know, uh, that was that's the most credit important. to D'Souza. Stephen D'Souza is one of the wittiest men you ever meet, and if you look at Die Hard. The, all the one-liners that made Bruce Willis famous when he's crawling into the thing, goes, oh, no, I know how a sardine feels. That's the Sousa. The Sousa has the wittiest, cleverest sense of humor. I mean, even when John claude pulls out that little knife and everybody, all the guys back away, then he doesn't realize his arm is behind him. All of that was the Sousa. So he he really, his comic timing, his his sense of humor comes through in that movie. And uh and it, it, it was. It was a funny film. There's a lot of funny moments in <laughs> Well, he, he wrote one of my favorite movies of all time, Commando. So Absolutely. Like, even <laughs> in Vegas, there's a scene where I'm in stage, and uh, one of the girls sees Ray take off his shirt. She throws away our Love Vega mask, the, the, the billboard. And, uh, and you see, my, he wanted me a reaction from him. I go, like, what the? <laughs> <laughs> all of that was the Sousa. The Sousa wanted those comic moments throughout the film. Where it's just like tongue in cheek. Love it, oh yeah, man. they they make a lot of those movies. Those moments make a lot of those movies what they are. Absolutely, he, it's the great writers know those are what makes you know that those comic relief is what makes great films. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Moments. 
Well, Jay, we certainly appreciate your time, man. And, and you're showing us that mask, showing out that original movie poster. Uh, it's just, just special stuff. And, and, I appreciate uh, it. I, even, um, I, I didn't keep it up. This, this statue is of one of um, 273, I believe. Wow. And um, I didn't keep everything, but this was, for example, where is it there? This was the hair thing for Vega. Cool. That thing on the back of his hair. But he had also one of these on his arms. He had one on his wrist. I didn't manage to keep all of them, but I try to keep all the memorabilia stuff to show the fans. That's um, great. And then, yeah, the, the, obviously the mask will go. Let's right go. There. What will you will you put it on just because we're just because we're crazy? Oh, there we go. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Chills. The best Chills. Show on the internet. If anybody doesn't watch the show. Vega is coming for you. So you better watch this episode specially. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Where Vega. where can people where, where can people find you, Jay, if they want to, you know, uh, follow you on, the on social media? Here's Looney Bin. <laughs> no. I'm on uh, I'm on all the social media. I'm on Instagram. Beware of all the fake ones because lately I don't know what's going on. I have like 10 fake accounts on Instagram. So look for the real guy. <laughs> awesome. yeah, What's Facebook, it? Instagram, Twitter, I'm everywhere. So, but really my pleasure. Thank you for asking me on. And it's because of folks like you that we do these kind of movies because, you know, you, you promote it, you support it, you love it. That's what it's all about. And I love all of you guys. Well, thank we, we greatly appreciate your time, man. And thank, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's, my pleasure. you know, Obviously, the movie played a big role in, in our lives, and uh, it's 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 amazing to see kind of the uh, how things have shifted over time, and now people look back on it with with uh, incredible, uh, and, and, yeah. yeah, it's great. So, well, thank you, Jay. I, I greatly appreciate you, man, and uh, I'll definitely be in touch.